What's going on, family? I'm Scrapbook Boxing, Museum of the Forgotten Fistigov series. I'm going to continue to examine 100 years of the greatest 150 black fighters of all times. And I want to take a look at Sam Baruti. Sam Baruti was something else. He was in front of my dad's. He had the same locker row as my dad in Stillman's gym. My dad would tell me stories about Sammy Baruti. Sammy Baruti was a kidder, but he meant business. He would walk into the gymnasium, say, I'm hitting hard today. <laughs> and he would go into the locker room. But before he went in the locker room, he would be looking all around to see what new person he can check out as he's walking his way into the locker room. Then he would get there and he would change his clothes and put on a gym attire, you know. And whoever he may spot, Hey, what's going on, man? How you doing? How was it out of town? Did you win your fight last night? And he'll go through all that. And then he'll come out. Now, he'll come out and start the shadow box and start hitting the bag. He would skip rope. He was a worker. He would sweat up a storm. But the party would start when he would be done working out and on his way out of the locker room as if he were to leave. He would put on his clothes, a three-piece suit, Vidora hat, shiny wingtip shoes. He had the pocket watch and the handkerchief, the whole thing, briefcase. And he would be walking out of the locker room. So when he would see a large crowd gathered around a ring, because then was Jim had two rings side by side from one another. And the press would be in the front row. And they were there so they can check out any up-and-coming young men that were coming from out of town or just starting out or even a fighter who had a fight coming up or even that evening because Madison Square Garden was not too far away from Stillman's gym. They were both on 8th Avenue. And so Sam Baruti would go to the ring that had the most crowd around it, who was making the most noise, as they called it. And in between rounds, he would tell that fighter, I'll see you, I'll be right back. Stay right here. He would go back into the locker room. He would take off his clothes and put on his gym attire. And he would come back out saying, I got next. <laughs> and he would be on his way out of the gym with his briefcase and gym bag and everything else. But that's the kind of person Sam Baruti was, according to my dad. But he was a middleweight. And he would have 16 fights in 1946. And he was consistent. He would lose one fight that year in 46. 1947. He would start fighting some guys that were main event fighters. He would take on Chuck Taylor and Buddy Farrell. And he would take on Holman Williams towards the end of 1946. And he would defeat Holman Williams. And everybody was shocked. He was congratulated and everything else about defeating Holman Williams. So in 1948, he would get the call. Because he would knock out Little Tiger Aaron Wade in 1947. And that really opened up the promoter's eyes. And an opportunity to take on the Cincinnati Cobra, Ezra Charles. But before he would get that shot with Charles, he had to take on Bob Satterfield. Now, he fought Bob Satterfield in January. And he would take on Ezra Charles in February, following month. And that was some fight with him and Bob Satterfield. Now, Bob Satterfield trained in Stillman's gym as well. And these two men would spar with one another in Stillman's gym. And they would have life-threatening sparring wars in that gym. So they knew each other. And this was an experience between these two men. But Sam Baruti didn't quite recover from that fight with Bob Satterfield. 
So he would face Bob Satterfield. January 23rd, 1948. But then February 20th of 1948, he would take on as a Charles. Now, as a Charles at this point in his career, would take it off. He started his career in 1940. He was in there with Jimmy Bivens and Archie Moore. He was in there with Charlie Burley, Lloyd Marshall. So he had a name for himself. In fact, the next year he would become heavyweight champion of the world and when he would defeat Jesse Joe Walcott in 49, he would pick up the NBA heavyweight version of the world championship title. And after the 10th round, towards the end of the 10th round, Baruti would be hit by a straight right hand of Ezra Charles. He would go down, and as the referee was counting him out, he himself was counting himself out. And he would wind up in Cook County Hospital the fight took place in Chicago. And Ezra Charles would be sitting on a hard bench all night long, praying that this man would be fine. And he didn't make it. And when the gym got word of what happened to Sam Baruti, it went quiet. Stillman, Lou Stillman had ordered a standing eight count. in that gym, no one could move. And they just all prayed for Sam Baruti because everyone liked Sam Baruti. And uh, Sam Baruti was a very good fighter. So I'm gonna place him 100 years of the greatest 150 black fighters of all times. He didn't get a chance to finish his career and he was on his way. And he was consistent. So Sam Baruti has been at it 100 years. The greatest 150 black fighters of all time. Shout out to Sam Baruti. Robert Lloyd, better known as Bob Forster, was born April 27th, 1942, Lubbock, Texas. He died November 11th, 2015. Bob Forster was just 77 years of age at the time of his death, and he would reside in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He would end his career as a sheriff after the love of boxing. He stood six foot three inches, had a 79 inch reach, had a total bout career of 65 fights, 56 wins, 46 knockouts, and eight losses. Now, he was married at the age of 18. But that didn't stop his boxing career. And he would lose his fight on a Saturday night, October 20th, 1962, New York's Madison Square Garden against New York's Harlem Doug Jones. Eight rounds, technical knockout, he was stopped by the referee Teddy Martin. And Forster was a replacement for Zero Foley. Forster was dropped in the first round, the eighth round, and the ninth round. But Doug Jones was a very tough New York fighter. In fact, Cassius Clay went the distance with Doug Jones. Cassius Clay had called around, and Doug Jones would make it the distance. Reminds me of George Foreman when he made his comeback, and Bigfoot Martin would raise his hands in victory for being the only fighter to go to distance with George Foreman. But Doug Jones was a hell of a fighter, man. He fought only Terrell for the vacant WBA heavyweight championship strap, and he came up short. On Friday, July 10th, 1964, Forster would face Ernie Terrell. Stopped in the seventh round. 
New York's Madison Square Garden by referee Arthur McCampy. He couldn't make it as a heavyweight, but he definitely made it as a light heavyweight. And what was amazing about Bob Fawcett, December 6, 1965, he'd be in the ring with Zora Foley. In the Municipal Auditorium, New Orleans, referee was Herman Dutruck. Ten rounds. It would be a unanimous loss. Friday, May 24th, 1968, after facing light heavyweight contenders, Eddie Cotton and Harry Kid Matthews, who would wind up becoming a heavyweight and who would be a contender for Rocky Marciano's crown. Bob Faces, former middleweight contender and current champion, Dick Tiger. It was a slugfest for four rounds. Bob Forster would introduce his left hook to the chin of Dick Tiger. It would be for the WBA WBC Light Heavyweight Championship crown. It was scheduled for 15 rounds in New York's Madison Square Garden. The referee was Mark Kahn. Now, Dick Tiger was born August 14, 1929, Nigeria. He died October 15, 1971. He was 42 years of age at the time of his death. Fought between 1952 and 1970. Stood five foot eight inches and had a 71 inch reach. He began boxing at the age of 19. And he would have a record of 82 total bouts, 60 wins, 27 knockouts, 19 losses, and he'd be stopped twice. He would be in the ring with fighters such as Rory Calhoun, Gene Armstrong, Harley Mims, Joey Giardello, Randy Sandy, Emil Griffith, Gene Fomer, Jose Torres, and Nino Benvenuti. So Dick Tiger. Couldn't take the heat of Bob Forster. Bob Forster would knock out Mike Quarry and others. So Bob Forster has been added to the list. 100 years of the greatest 150 black fighters of all time. He has been consistent, but he was a light heavyweight champion. Matthew Saad Muhammad, born August 5th, 1954, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He would die 2014 in Philadelphia. He stood 5 foot 11 inches and had 117 and a half inches in reach. <laughs> it seemed that way. But he had a 72 and a half inch reach. He weighed 187 to 200 pounds. He was managed by Sam Solomon. Now the story of Matthew Saad Muhammad is a sad one. The age of five. At well, the age of four, his mother had died, and his aunt had took him in with his brother. And at the age of five, his aunt realized that she couldn't take care of both young boys. So she would ask the older brother to take Matthew Saad Muhammad to the park, but don't come back with him. So that's what happened. The Ben Franklin Parkway. There was a park near there, and his brother decided that it wasn't going to be him not to come back. It would be Matthew. And his name was Maxwell Antonio Locks. And they would play red light, green light, one, two, three. And Matthew Saad Muhammad was too fast. He kept seeing his brother starting to run. So he decided to play hide and go see. And Maxwell, we'll call him, didn't want to be found. So he would run far and apart. And he turned around and his brother wasn't there. And that was his life to the point where he was found on a Ben Franklin Parkway. And Sister Bernadine, who was a nun, someone spotted him and brought him over to her. And she would rename him Matthew for the scripture. And she would rename him Franklin because that's where he was found. At the Ben Franklin Parkway. He would find religion and he would become Matthew Saad Muhammad. But the fights that he would participate in him is why he's on this list of 100 years of the greatest 150 black fighters of all times. He fought Luwali. He fought Dwight Braxton. He was in the ring with Yaki Lopez. In fact, I was at that Lopez fight, 1978 at the Philadelphia Spectrum. And it went eight rounds. 
but my God, what a fight that was. And they would fight again in a rematch. McAveen, New Jersey. But Matusad Muhammad was a hell of a fighter. And he definitely deserves to be on this list. Because of his consistency. Because of the men he fought. Now, he never fought Michael Spinks. To this day, I, I'm still not sure what the story is with that. But I would not take that away from him. Because he fought everyone else. So shout out to Matthew Saad Muhammad. He has been added to the list. 100 years of the greatest 150 black fighters of all time. On behalf of Curtis Anderson and myself. We want to shout out Matthew Saad Muhammad. Bob Foster. Sammy Baruti for being added to the list of 100 years, the greatest 150 black fighters of all times.